the class. You are currently the only person in this conference. So um, I hope this finds you well. So today I want us to start with this uh, topic on sensation and perception. And um, we see, we see first, or we normally use our five common senses in order to communicate to our mind the condition of our surroundings. For example, you use your eyes to see something. But before your brain or before you know that you have seen a bright thing or you have seen any color, it's the work of your senses first to capture that color and then send signal through the nerves to the brain for the brain to be able to interpret that signal and make it to a meaningful, uh, meaningful form. For you to be able to know that you have been hurt. Or are you able to hear me, James? Yes, I can. Yeah. Or you can, hear, I, you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. So uh, today I want us to go through sensation and perception topic. And as yes. I was saying, <laughs> um, before, you, before you send something, Sensing comes in forms of seeing, sensing comes in, in form of touch. I'll yes. have to unmute you. Yes, let me just unmute you for us to uh, to have, a because I think I'm hearing some background noise, a lot of background noise. So we can just, uh, let me just, if you, if in case you have any question or anything that you want to comment on as I talk, you can just unmute your mic. So as I was saying, before you sense something, sensing comes, uh, by use of the five common senses that you normally use through eyes, through taste, through uh, smelling, through touch, for you to be able to know that you've been hurt or you've been touched by someone. The 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 part that have been that have been hurt normally have some nerve endings. So those nerve endings will send a signal or message to the brain, and then the brain um interpret or even analyze first and interpret that signal into a meaningful form for you to be able to know that part is hurting so it's something that normally occur at a very fast rate because signals are normally transferred at a very fast rate through the brain so that's what i want us to see and what is uh what is uh how can we use sensation and perception in psychology Yes. So first, let's define or see the meaning of the two, and then we can continue and see how we relate the two in psychology of communication, or how do we apply the two when we are applying psychology when uh, uh, in our communication to whoever that we are communicating to. So sensation is the process of receiving stimuli, energies, and signals from the external environment encoding it in neural signals and sending the signals to the brain. So the stimulus are normally sent to the brain through neurons. The other name of nerves is neurons. So and this information is in form of signal. So the brain now will go and do its analysis, do interpretation, and then send back a feedback signal to the organ that needs to do an action for you to be able to withdraw your hand that is maybe hurting or to remove your eyes or to unfocus your eyes from the bright eye of the maybe a, a light that is too bright you need 
signals from the brain. So the work of the neuron is to transport that signal to um, to the brain. Then human nerve, uh, human beings, sorry, are endowed with five senses through which they are in contact with the environment. We are we can normally communicate through to the environment through sense of touch, hearing, smell, taste, and sight. Then for perception, this refers to the process by which the brain selects, organizes, and interprets sensation. We also refer to the, all of this as analyzing the sensation or analyzing the signals. So the brain receives sensory information through the sensory process, analyzes this information, makes decisions, and commands the muscles of the body to action. It's not necessarily only the muscles. We also have organs. For example, if an organ um, need, for example, if the heart needs to pump the blood at a very fast rate, it needs the brain to send that signal to in order for the muscles of the heart to contract uh, faster or even to relax if in case you need to relax. So sensation and perception are important because they are our principal link to the outside world or the environment. What we know of reality depends largely on the information we gather, we gather through our senses. But remember, it's also the work of the brain to select. It doesn't on, always um, take all the signals coming from the external environment. For example, when you're in a class, you're able to focus yourself to the lecturer who is in front of you and ignore all other signals, even if you have a lot of sound nearby or maybe other type of signals coming from the, uh, from the environment. It's the work of the brain to select some of these signals and work on those signals or um, interpret those signals. Otherwise, if the brain was capturing all the signals coming from uh, surrounding or, or, or from the surrounding or from the environment, then we'll be a confused guy. So it's the work of the brain to really select what signals comes uh, through the neurons to the brain. So what are there some factors that normally perception? The way it, we interpret things or the way we see things, for example, some or we can um two of us can see a person the way i will perceive this person or my perception toward that person will be different or might be different can be the same or might be different from another person's perception towards that individual one person person may uh, may, may may perceive that individuals are very but the other individual may, may perceive the other the, the person uh, in terms of their personality. So it depends with various factors um, or this perception or how, how someone normally perceive things depends on different factors. So the fact facts uh, the first factor is our expectations. And this is one of the factors that normally affect our interpretation of a sensory stimulus or stimuli. Some are unable to accurately assess a situation because of what we expect, what you did expect of someone or what did you expect of a situation or an event can really um, uh, affect how you perceive that situation or an event or a person. This is also known as perceptual set. If, for instance, we expect to see something gigantic, if we're expecting to see something that is very huge, but what is presented to us happened to be small, those thing, we are likely to say that we are not shown the actual thing. So what you expected can really affect how you perceive the same same event or situation or even an object. The second factor is perceptual context factor in perception. And um, other stimuli or other present at the same time might also affect our interpretation of a situation.
For example, imagine you're given a talk or you're giving a talk story to a group of people. And beside your mastery of what you want to convey or the message, your appearance and mannerism will also determine the effectiveness of your performance. How you, how you appear when, for example, you're addressing an audience, the dress, your facial expressions, your, your posture, how you present yourself can really interfere with the message. So you're, 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 you're kind of presenting different signals to the audience. So when two or more signals are presented at the same time, they might contradict each other or they might cause a person to, uh, to change their perception. For example, if you're not dressed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a formal way and you're dressing a, a formal audience, for example, you're in a conference, there is a way that you're supposed to dress when you are dressing a conference. So if you dress casually, people will focus more on what you've dressed and really not focus on what you're saying. Even if you have, you're really a good public speaker, you might end up losing your audience because of these uh, other stimuli that you're presenting to them. So some members of the group may miss the message because they will concentrate on your inappropriate dress, your dullness, maybe you're so boring, in presentation and so on. You can also give other examples. Then the third factor is motivational factor, which can also influence perception. For instance, we need food. We may perceive stones as edible. If we need food, for instance, you may perceive something that is not edible as edible. So children in need of security might perceive their parents as being an abnormal human being, such that they are very large, they are very stronger than other people, because just because they are motivated by the security aspect of their parents. So each and every child believes that their, uh, their parents is a supernatural human being because they provide for them, they give them security. Whenever they need something, they're the one that normally provide for them. So this motivational factor can also change how we normally perceive things. So person in dire need of money might perceive a piece of paper removed from another person's pocket as money and many, many other examples. So the motivational factor here normally also will interfere with the perception of a person. Then number four factor is our experience with stimuli, which may be sharpened or which may be, uh, which may uh, sharpen our perception of the same. A person who has been already exposed to using a gadget like a fridge might not mistake it for a cupboard because you're using you're used to seeing fridge the fridge you're used to, to using the gadget you're used to using um, um an iron box but for a person who have never seen that iron box may perceive that iron box as something else may perceive that fridge as something else a person who have never seen a jembe may perceive a jembe as maybe a big, a big spoon or something because they have never seen that. But if you're used to seeing it or you, you have a repeated stimulus of the same or you have been receiving a repeated stimulus from the same, you or your experience with that stimulus, this normally sharpen your perception towards that thing. So experience with people's way of life, that is culture, may help a person relate with them more effectively than would otherwise have been the case. So experience here is also uh, normally affects in one way or another the, uh, the, the way we perceive things or even situations or objects. Another factor, people interests, values, emotions, and so on may influence their perception of sensory stimuli. Your interest, your attitudes towards something, the values that you have some uh, that you have on 
event or situation or even a person may also interfere or influence the perception towards that stimuli. People differ in the way they perceive shape, depth, motion, color, events, and even situation. For example, if I when I see a red, a red, a red color, I see danger. Or maybe I perceive that uh, a red color is associated to danger. Whenever I see the red color, even if there are flowers that have been presented to me in red color, I'll perceive that flower is a danger sign. So your 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 attitude, your beliefs, your interest will come in, influence how you perceive things. If, for example, you have you believe that when you see an owl as they used to believe or some of us we normally believe that even now in your village there is someone that will die in that village that is your beliefs and a stereotype that will also influence your perception so some of these um beliefs and perception and emotion are related to the culture of where someone comes from. So still those can also affect your perception towards a situation, an object, or a person. Then still under perception, we have nonverbal communication. And communication, and this involves communication that involves um, unspoken language where we are using facial expressions, we are using gestures, we are using posture, we are using eye contact to communicate. But normally, this normally go hand in hand with spoken word or spoken language. We normally use the two concurrently, but in some cases, we normally use, in some cases, we are forced to use the nonverbal communication. And this nonverbal communication will portray the inner feelings what you feel the inner feelings are normally portrayed by this nonverbal communication and they're usually revealed through five basic channels we have through facial expressions frowning smiling uh, winking eye contact are you gazing to a person are you staring at a person are you making it also can also so you're staring you're gazing or you're paying attention to a person then body movement the way you're moving your body are you moving your hands for example when you're um there is a way that you can call someone through body movement there is a way that you can use the body movement to communicate then posture when you're communicating what kind of posture are you using touching also when your hand shaking someone when you're tapping the shoulder of someone what is that you're still communicating to the individual so facial expression reveals six basic emotions you can reveal anger you frown you can reveal fear you can reveal happiness you can laugh you can smile you can reveal sadness you can reveal even surprise as well as disgust then the meaning of facial expressions are influenced by culture contextual and situational factors the context the situation the culture will influence the way you are using your facial expression and they can be translated into an, underst an uh, under understandable cues or understandable form eye contact as an unverbal cue can also have different meanings for example high level of gazing is often regarded as a sign of affection the avoidance of eye contact may signify, uh, may signify unfriendliness or bashfulness. You feel ashamed, you feel shy, you feel unfriendly to this individual such that you're not even able to look at them. Then or you're not willing to look at them. Then an exception to the idea that gazing is 
associated with affection is staring, which can be seen as a sign of hostility. When you stare to someone or when you stare to, uh, for example, to an individual or a child, there is a way that you can show hostility. Uh, when mothers, and this um, happens uh, uh, majority in motherhood, there is a way that a mother can look at a child and a child see that there is danger coming. So this is staring. So these facial expressions uh, will have different meanings depending on the context, depending on the situation, as well as depending also on the culture someone comes from. So give me a minute, I attend to something. One minute, I'm coming back. So uh, other, other types of nonverbal communication include large number of body movements, which normally might suggest emotional arousal. When, for example, um, a lady who is feeling some shyness and the gentleman who is talking to the lady, the lady might show some emotional arousal by moving a lot of her body parts. So then we have large patterns of body movements. We have patterns here and we have numbers here. Don't get confused. For large patterns can suggest contrasting emotions, such as threatening posture or welcoming with when you're using different patterns or when you're using different uh, types of body movement, you can show or this can signify, signify some contrasting emotions. Then we have specific information about feeling is sometimes provided by gestures. Gestures fall into different categories and the most important of which are emblems, and these are body movements which carry specific meaning within different cultures. So we can still use gestures to communicate and show different um, uh, different types of uh, information. So specific gestures can have different meaning for men and women. Touching, for example, is another nonverbal um, non channel that reveals our inner feelings. And the message is con uh, it conveys depends on who does the touching and the nature of the contact in the context. So touching can either portray negative message or positive message, depending on the context. So when touching is judged inappropriate, it may elicit strong negative reactions. Appropriate touching is usually positive. One acceptable, uh, acceptable way of touching is handshaking, tapping on the shoulders. But if the touching is inappropriate, definitely it will elicit or it will cause strong negative emotions. Then um, how do we recognize uh, deception in nonverbal cues so generally we are not good at recognizing deception because we tend to perceive others as being truthful we can use or someone can use nonverbal cues to deceive you using the nonverbal cues majority of people uh, do not recognize on uh, or generally people do not recognize deception because we tend to perceive others as being truthful. So also we tend to be polite and do not give sufficient attention to nonverbal cues, except when people are in high belong. So in majority of cases, people do not pay much attention when someone is talking or they do not, uh, they do not uh, pay much attention to the nonverbal communication uh, way when someone is talking to them, because if the nonverbal is not going hand in hand with, or it's portraying a different message from what someone is saying, then that might be a deception, or that might not be true, or whatever, whatever they're saying using the word of mouth might not be true if 
whatever they are portraying using gestures, you using this nonverbal cue is not going hand in hand. For example, if someone is telling you of something uh, that is positive, but their facial expression is different, maybe they are frown, they are showing some level of um, disgust, whatever that they're saying, then if you're not paying attention to their facial expression and their body movement, then you might be deceived. So they seem to be better at reading relevant nonverbal cues. Then we can tell when others are deceiving us by being on the lookout for certain nonverbal cues. For you to be able to know whether someone is deceiving you, you have to pay attention to what they're saying as well as to their nonverbal cues. What, what is their body language? Is their body language going concurrently with the words that they are using? Is the body language going against what they are doing or what they are saying? If, for example, someone wants to show some affection, which is really showing some other, maybe disgust or something, then you'll know that, and you pay attention to both, then you'll know that they are deceiving you. So it's really important that a person pays attention to the nonverbal cues. So the first of these are micro expressions or fleeting facial expression lasting only less than a second. For example, there is a way that a person will smile. If the smile takes less than a second, the smiling period is very short. Then you know this smiling is not true or whatever that they want to show me through the smile is not correct. Then others are inner internal uh, inter-channel de discrepancies such as aspect of eye contact, exaggerated facial expressions, and raising voice or pitch. For example, if a person is not paying attention to you but they're just gazing, they're just staring, their mind might not be present at that moment. They want to show you that they're paying attention by just looking at you. But if they're staring at you, then they might not be paying much attention to what you uh, they're saying. Then exaggerated facial expression, there is a way that a person can use an exaggerated smile. Then you'll know that these are not a genuine smi uh, smile. There is a way that a person will talk to you. Maybe the message that they want to pass to you is a positive message, but they're using uh, a very high voice pitch, then you might definitely know that they are not true or they are not untrue in whatever that they want to show you. Then women have superior skills in sending and receiving non-verbal cues. And this, is, this might be a reflection of the roles and stereotype in society. However, men tend to be more susceptible to deception or women or sorry women tend to be more susceptible to deception than men even if they really know how to use these nonverbal cues they can be easily deceived as compared to those uh, as compared to men because they are not able they are not able to really pay much attention to the nonverbal to the nonverbal cues but for the men men it's a highly unlikely that they will be deceived by um and true nonverbal cues next subtopic still under perception and uh, sensation and perception is attribution and in order to understand why people including ourselves do what they do we use a process known as attribution we try to identify the cause of behavior and so gain knowledge of traits and depositions. For us to be able to understand ourselves together with other people or how for, for us to, to be able to ourselves well and also people we normally use attribution or is attribution is a process under which a person will understand himself or for herself and also understand those that they interact with each and every day we have theories that normally explains 
how we perceive ourselves and also we perceive other people. And the first theory is here the theory of attribution. And Hedda discussed a very simple dichotomy where making either internal or external attribution. So when a father, for example, had yelled at his son, we can make an external or an internal attribution depending on one person and the other. Okay, depending on what kind of a person you are. So for example, one person will use that yelling to determine the behavior of the father. The other person might use that yelling to find what caused or what situation led to the yelling. So one person will start to analyze the father using the yelling, disregarding what might have caused or the situation that have, might have caused the, the yelling to the son. But the other individual might first look at what is causing this yelling and then find the cause of the yelling. So we can make an internal attribution and decide that the father, the father's behavior tell us something about himself. He has an aggressive personality or negative general dis disposition, or their internal personalities are very it's very bad or it's negative. Or we may make an, an external attribution and decide that the cause of the father's behavior had something to do with the situation. So one individual will use that yelling to the individual personality, and the other will look at what led to the yelling or what led to that event. So one might have been nearly hit by a car after running across a street without looking. So one person will look at the external attribution, will perceive this individual by looking what is causing the situation. Well, the other will look at the internal personality of this individual by using that situation. So if you make an internal attribution in this particular case, we will have a negative impression of the father. You'll end up hating that individual. But if you have a positive impression of him, if we make, we'll have a positive impression of him, uh, of him if we make what? An external attribution. So the very preferred case here is, external attribution look at the surrounding or the situation that has led to a present event or a present situation or what is leading to the occurrence of the present situation the second theory is correspondent inference theory and this theory explores how we use information about others behavior to, ident uh, to identify the stable traits or dispositions. How we use others' behavior to identify their personalities. So according to the theory, we focus on certain types of behavior which are likely to be most informative. You can focus mostly on the behavior of a person in order to determine their inner personality, the stable traits and dispositions so people try to deduce oh sorry there are three uh, these are freely chosen behaviors non common effects caused by one specific factor factor but but not by others and behaviors grow in social desirability So, um, so these are freely chosen behaviors, the non-common effects or the effects caused by one specific factor and behaviors 
low in social desirability. So you choose some behaviors in a person that normally are in low social disability, that are normally not really accepted by the society and determine the personality of this individual. So people try to deduce to choose or infer internal traits or disposition from observable behavior. So, uh, sorry, I was saying, um, this theory uses or explores how we normally use or how we normally choose information and information in this uh, uh, matter is behavior that someone portrays to us to determine the year internal personality or the personality so we use the behavior to interpret or to analyze the personality of this individual but in this case we are seeing the behavior and especially the behavior that is not acceptable in the society that we are in so the closer and inferred underlying trait or disposition Truly, repre uh, truly represent the overt behavior in question, the greater the correspondent between the trait and the behavior. So the closer the behavior that you have chosen to analyze the personality of this person is to the real personality of this individual, and the greater that our answer will be correct or the closer to, uh, uh the closer to the real personality for example if i see an individual maybe not wearing as uh, as not wearing as how maybe my culture perceive appropriate dressing is if i use that to analyze and interpret the personality of this individual I might end up perceiving, perceiving the personality of this individual, which is not correct. But if I look at other behaviors, for example, the positive behavior of this individual, I might come up with the best personality or the correct personality of this individual. Because, for example, the dressing that uh, some people or all of us, we normally use dressing code, to perceive the personality of an individual but you might find the individual have a very good personality if you analyze this personality well or if you uh or the, you analyze this individual well using many or using all the observable behavior that you uh that that this individual portrays but if you select the traits or characteristic of this individual that are not acceptable according to you or according to the society that you're living in, then you might not have good perception of the personality of this individual. So to or the closer the, the characteristic that we have chosen to use are to the personality of this individual, then the closer to the correct personality of these individuals you be so it's really good that um we use a wide range of 
traits in order to uh, in order to in order to in order to perceive the individual well using the uh, the right personality or the inner personality then the third theory is Kelly's theory of casual or uh, casual attribution and it focuses on whether a behavior is by situational factor or personal factor so for this theory it will focus on uh, to determine whether this behavior is caused by the situation where this individual is or is in or the personal factors of this individual so this depends on three types of information number one is consensus the extent to which other persons react to some stimuli or event in a similar way so the way you perceive a person either in terms of situation or in terms of personality will depend on three things number one is consensus consistency and this consensus is the extent to which other people react to some stimulus or event in a similar way for example if you're used to people when they see uh, when they see a cockroach they're used to cockroach So, video to And this is the extent to which an individual responds to a given stimuli or situation in the same way on different occasions. So, for example, if you're dealing with an individual who will uh, react differently in different places, but in the, in the same same situation. For example, let me still use the same uh, example I used up there, cockroaches. If, for example, you went to an old woman's house to find cockroaches, and this individual did not show any disgust or did not show any surprise or any fear, but you went to another woman who is not old and find cockroaches, but this individual shows a different perception or a different maybe facial expression they are disgusted at this point or they get surprised at that point then you can use that to to um to judge this individual or to you can use that to uh, use that to perceive the personality of this individual then distinctiveness the extent to which an individual responds in a different manner to different stimuli or events so the way a person will react towards different events or different situations you can also use that to perceive that individual's personality so the way a person will um will perceive another individual's or another individual's personality will depend on whether the behavior is caused by a situation or personal factor and this will also cause the different in perception when you're dealing with different people but this will depend on consensus and this is the extent to which people react to stimuli or event in similar way or the extent to which an individual responds to a given stimulus that is consistency and 
distinct the distinctiveness for example when you wrong a person then the person gets angry really angry and then over all of a sudden when this person experiences a positive situation and they get happy then depending on how they will respond to different uh, or uh, respond in a different manner to different situation you can still use that to perceive this individual or to 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 you can use that to interpret how this individual's personality is if this personality or if this individual's personality doesn't change in different events or they respond in a in um in um in an organized way let me use organized way in different events then you can still use that to perceive the personality of these individuals depending on how they respond to different events or to different situations so this theory uh, focuses more on the behavior caused by either situational factors or personal factors behaviors are caused by situational factors other behaviors are caused by personal factors but this will depend on consensus consistency and distinctiveness Then fact that make friends attribution. What are these facts that will influence how I perceive another person as well as if myself is augmenting or the tendency to attach greater importance to a potential cost of behavior or, or behavior occurrence despite presence of other inhibitors. We have discounting and this is the uh, this is the tendency to attach less importance to one potential cause of behavior when other potential causes are also present so in augmenting people tend to attach greater importance to potential causes of behavior so the way you perceive me will be affected by two things either augmenting or discounting in augmenting you are focusing more on the potential cause of the behavior of my behavior for example the example i use on a, a, a man yelling to a son because a car is he was about to kick that uh, the the boy off the road focus on the cause of my behavior or when you focus on the causes of the man or the man yelling to the child this will influence how you perceive that individual's personality but if you don't focus on the potential cause of the yelling even when potential cause is also even when other potential causes are also present then you might end up as that individual so you get away do you do not cause
the village if they don't focus on what is really uh, what is the cause of this inappropriate behavior maybe this child have been or have been uh, have, have grown up in this way have been dressed up in this way from the time they were very young to this age if they don't focus on the causes of the dressing code of this individual and focus more on the dressing code then they will perceive this individual in a different way or in a negative way but they were supposed to perceive this individual in a positive way if they had augmented on the potential causes rather than discounting the potential causes of the dressing or the inappropriate dressing code of this individual. You are currently the only person in this conference. You are currently the only person in this conference. Issues, but we still manage and still try and make sure that we go through this topic so as i was saying before the internet was off so there are basic sources of error of attribution or there are some of uh, some of the causes of us perceiving others incorrectly or in an incorrect way includes the following so the first one is correspondence bias also known as fundamental attribution and this is the tendency to explain others action disregarding or to to explain other actions as steering from disposition we disregard the situation that led to this individual act the way they acted at a particular situation so we disregard all that and we, we we interpret their personality by use of what we saw how they behave or how they behaved or the actions that they portrayed at that point so the reason as to why this error occur is because number one we tend to focus more on the action of the individual rather than the situation that they are in is you if you focus more on 
how the individual behaved in a particular situation rather than not focusing on how or what caused the individual to behave in a particular manner then you will end up having an error when you're uh, interpreting the personality of this individual then the second one we notice situational causes but attribute insufficient weight to their importance importance sometimes you know the cause of someone behaving in a particular way but you still don't want to give the, or the that situation more importance or that, that cause more importance you just want to um focus more on the behavior rather than the cause of the behavior then number three call or the number three reason is that we follow two-step attribution process where we first consider an individual's underlying characteristics and only then take situational factors into account first you perceive this or first to interpret the personality first or you use the action or the behavior of that person and interpret first the personality of this individual and then later try to 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 look for the cause already you have already you have um you have compromised your answer or your correct or your correct um uh interpretation of the personality of this individual if first you judge them by their action rather than looking at the cause first so it's good that we first analyze the causes of a particular situation before we interpret the, uh, the personality of an individual by use of the behavior another cause of error is actor observer effect and in this era we attribute our own behavior to situational causes and the behavior of others to internal or dispositional causes we act uh, accurately aware of external factors affecting our own actions but not so so aware of external factors affecting the behaviors of others so you see your own behavior is as a result of a situation cost but if a person was in the same similar situation and behave the same way you behaved you're still judging them there is some circumstances or there are some people that do that. If you behave, if you if you yell to this child who is doing a wrong thing, so you interpret that as appropriate because you're using it because you uh, the the situation under which you yelled at this individual cost you to uh, to yell. But if another person yells at this child you will start to perceive this individual, you start to judge this individual, depending on how they behaved against that child. But remember they're behaving the same, same way you behaved in the same, same situation. But due to this actor observer effect, you may end up having errors when you're perceiving the other individual. Then you have another cause of error, that is the serving, the self-serving bias. And in this error, we normally tend to attribute one's own positive outcomes to internal causes and negative outcomes to external causes. If, for example, you're, 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 you're acting in a positive manner, you use that outcome to, to perceive yourself as a good individual to have a good personality but if for example you end up misbehaving or portraying negative misbehavior or portraying negative behavior or misbehavior in short you tend to explain your misbehavior or you tend to 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 portray that this misbehaving was caused by the situation that i was for example if you drink alcohol and start yelling around start doing other things or bad things or inappropriate uh, things or portraying inappropriate, inappropriate behavior 
you might end up accusing the alcohol or using the alcohol as the cause of you misbehaving. But if, for example, you portrayed good personality aspects or good outcomes, then you use that good outcome to explain your personal personality. So you're using negative outcome or you're using, um, you're, you're, you're attributing the negative outcome as, as being caused by an external cause. And the same same time, you're attributing your own positive outcomes to be as a result of internal causes or internal personality. That's how we normally are. We always look at blaming others or blaming the environment, blaming what is surrounding us if we are caught in an inappropriate situation or in, a, in doing an inappropriate thing. But when we behave good or we portray good personality or we portray good things or we portray good outcomes, we normally attribute that as, as a result of your own inner personality. So reasons for the self-serving bias may be of a cognitive, that is attribute success to internal causes or motivational nature to protect the and, and enhance our self-esteem. Yes. So the nature of the self-serving bias varies across cultures. The nature of these self-serving bias will differ depending on what culture an individual, an individual will come from. And this will differ depending on or from one individual to the other individuals. So we normally try to enhance our self-esteem by, uh, uh, by attributing our positive outcome as a result of our internal personality. So we motivate ourselves through the use of this self-serving bias. Otherwise, when you'd always be judging yourself um, negatively, even if you have good outcomes, maybe judging yourself, you are acting, I'm acting this way because I want to be praised, I want to uh, to appear good, then you your self-esteem will be low. Because if, for example, you want to motivate yourself to be a good person, do good things, you have to use them self-serving bias or we normally use the self-serving bias in order to boost our self-esteem but for a person who have low self-esteem they will always have that uh they will always um blame themselves rather than blaming what is around them so applications of this attribution theory or these attribution theories includes defending defensive attributions are those attribution we make when we notice that we are similar to someone who has experienced negative outcome. And this attribution, attribution might also explain the different attribution males and females tend to make in sexual harassment cases. Where, for example, increasing males' awareness of their similarity to the victims of harassment and this is making them aware that they, they themselves can also be harassed, may lead men to blame sexual harassment perpetrators more than they do usually do. Because once a, a female is harassed, you'll find people blaming um, the individual rather than blaming the uh, what costs um, uh, what costs um, uh, blaming the individual rather than blaming whoever costs the harassment, because you'll find people saying that they were not dressed in a in a inappropriate way. They were inappropriately dressed. They seduced this individual. They want to use. Uh, they want to uh, hurt these individuals by accusing them that they are harassed, rather than looking at what 
uh, really or what really led to this harassment and by that they will blame these sexual harassment uh, perpetrators rather than blaming these individuals uh, or blaming this individual who is being harassed so when you blame and you condemn those who normally harass children harass um, adolescent children harass even um, old people then you'll be able to reduce this harassment but when you always blame this harassment on these women on these children maybe you had uh, you're blaming the parents of these children rather than blaming whoever that caused the harassment take for instance a child is raped how can you explain that if you blame the child raping or if you blame the mother did not take care of this child well neglected the child security or things like that rather than blaming whoever that caused the raping you will end up not solving the solution or we will not end up not having the cause of the of the rape but when you blame whoever that caused this harassment or this rape or this even a uh, robbery you'll be able to overcome the robbery so we can apply these attribution theories in different situations in order to have solutions to different um, causes of behavior in our society. Then we have still sensitive perception, impression formation, and impression management. So in impression formation is the through which we, we form impressions of others. We focus firstly on information pertaining to people's traits, values, principles, and only then on information regarding their competence. So the way or the impressions that you normally form the first instance you see an individual for example if you a doctor who is not who is dressed like um a doctor who is just dressed in rags or a doctor who is not dressed in a in a formal way or in expensive clothes because according to you you know that doctors are normally paid well or professors are normally paid well but when the professor comes to class and maybe you see this professor wearing second hand clothes first impression is normally as a result of how people will read this individual or we perceive this individual depending on their traits their values and their principle then after maybe this professor starts to teach these individuals then this individual these students may come to know that this professor is very competent in whatever that they normally teach so research shows that impressions of others involves two components we have exemplars of traits or behavior and this is concrete examples of their behavior and abstraction of traits or behavior and this is overall behavior in our dominant impression so when people make judgment about others they recall examples of their behavior and based base their judgment on these two factors so you first your first impression to an individual to a person
So um once you you for example in a class when you are in a class and a professor that I've never taught you comes in the way you perceive that professor by just looking at that professor the way maybe they are dressed the way they present themselves to you you the first thing that comes to your mind is impression or you 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 make some impression you form some impression on who the professor is in terms of personality but as you come to know or even to listen to this professor you will have a more clear picture on more personality concerning this professor as well as the competence of this professor or the competence level of this professor for example a professor can come with second hand clothes in your class dressed in a second hand clothes so you may perceive this professor maybe they're not competent they don't look to know what they really are supposed to teach you so the the impression that you normally form first is always not majority of it is not correct but as we come to understand more or interact more with these individuals we tend to um we tend to we tend to be or to to we tend to understand this individual more as we interact more with this individual so initially our impressions are based on exemplars that is concrete examples of their behavior but as we know a person better abstractions of their overall behavior is our dominant impression so we have two things that normally affect or that normally influence impression formation we have exemplar traits for behavior and this is that concrete examples of their behavior how do they as you continue to know or as you continue to interact with this individual the abstraction of traits or behavior comes that in order to interpret to analyze the personality of this individual and this is the overall behavior which is a dominant impression so as you continue interacting with this individual you will be able to know the overall or uh, in average or in uh in whole how do this individual uh, or who is this individual in terms of their personality but at the first instant you used maybe their physical appearance only to judge them or to interpret their personal uh or their personality but as you continue to interact this individual you will come or you will combine the way they dress the way they talk the way they address you, the way they present to you. So you are combining a lot of this behavior, uh, of this individual's behavior to interpret the personality of this individual. So cognitively, we tend to put people, we meet in large familiar social categories. So when you meet a person, you will say that these people, these individuals are like, the ones that are normally pride, proud, the ones that are normally very rude, the rude people. But as you continue to know this individual, you will have or you will base your impression depending on their personal personality. So we also base our impressions on what we think we know about the person belonging to these categories. But when we can focus more on people as individuals, not as category members will know them better when you focus more on these individuals you interact with them you'll be able to know them better and know their real personality but at first we normally categorize them in groups this individual um this individual or this person is a rude person ni watu wenye wanakuanga wabaya ni watu wenye wanakuanga rude so we are categorizing this individual into a certain category of individuals but as we continue to interact with this individual you'll be able to really know the personality or the real personality 
of individuals or this individual as you continue interacting with them. So that will be the end of sensation and perception topic. So in sensation and perception topics, we are dealing with how do we perceive others and how do we perceive ourselves and what are the factors that normally influence how we perceive whoever that we interact with and also how do we perceive ourselves. So impressions when it comes to attribution and uh, other factors with inference, how we normally perceive people in different situations, in different circumstances. So that will be the end of today's lecture, unless you have any questions, James. James. So you can open your mic and ask any question. Or you can just text whichever that you want or make any comment. So James, are you still there? Yes. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. For example, if a person is constantly in conflict with other people to the extent of these people starting to avoid him mm -hmm. or her, mm -hmm. and when he discovers this, he gets depressed. Uh -huh. What kind of a help can you offer that person? When this individual, the issue here is self-esteem. Uh -huh. Because once a person has very low self-esteem, mm -hmm. they will always blame themselves. Even if the situation, um, even if, for example, they will not really speak out, they will always keep things to themselves. Mm -hmm. For example, if this individual um, is in a situation where they are being condemned, they will not be able mm -hmm. to speak out. So you mm -hmm. have to really work on the self-esteem self because uh, if a person have a good and high self-esteem they're able to speak out when someone mm. makes them sad wataweza kuji kujieleze ama ku speak out whatever they are uh, they maybe in a in a better way because also self-esteem low self-esteem mm -hmm. can lead a person to have um so anti-social behavior such that apikosewa mm -hmm. And I do work mm. to respond to this individual. I, I'm either I'm supposed to either abuse this individual or even uh, fight with this individual. But if I'm able to speak out, I'm able to express mm. myself. Mm. If I'm able to express myself, I'll be able to express myself in, in such a way that the other person will not be hurt by what I'm saying. And by that, I'll not keep things to myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how can you boost your self-esteem? Assume that we one have a low self-esteem. How can you help such a person to boost his self-esteem? How to help a person to boost uh, the, the, uh, their own self-esteem? First, yeah. and by understanding that they have low self-esteem. Telling them or uh, mm -hmm. showing them how to express themselves. Yeah. If at all you hurt me in any way, I'm supposed to speak out. I'm supposed to show you that I'm hurt and make sure that you'll never hurt me again because I'll explain to why are you hurting or uh, uh, the way I'm hurt and the reason as to why you have really hurt me. For example, but you're not happy with how they are, uh, responding to or how they are talking to you. But if you're able to tell them that they really need to change how they normally talk to you, then you're able to overcome another instant that the same same will repeat itself. Otherwise, mtu wa kinyamaza, wengine watendelea ku hurt this individual, and these individuals will be hurt in such a way that they will not be able even to talk to this individual, the other individual. That's why you, you see some people start to withdraw themselves from others because they see others as maybe when i'm in, uh, uh, when i interact with the other individual he always hurt me but when you know that the other individual is hurting you and you're able to confront this individual in a better way 
you'll be able to overcome and repetition of that uh, in future.